I think as someone who's worked in security for a number of years, I can only echo that in saying it would be horrible in three or four months' time for us to go back into any organisation that's downloaded the GPR-8 or taken on board a, a paper copy and to find it just sitting on the security manager's desk and it hasn't been read by HR, it hasn't been discussed with finance and it certainly hasn't come across to the attention of those who are in charge of the risk analysis for the organisation in terms of the organisational uh, responsibilities because we're not just talking about our security risk management, we are talking about our viability as organisations, our ability to achieve our mission and mandate and it's very important to integrate this as closely as we can to those processes. So thank you very much. I'd now like to open the floor to questions. I am cognizant that we do have a number of people online at this stage who also may have questions and so we'll try to mix those questions into questions from the floor at the moment. If you would like to ask a question of any of the panel at this stage, I'd ask that you uh, put your hand up and you also then state your name and your organisation or if you're an independent, that you're an independent or you're a researcher or interested in this topic just so we get an idea also of who's asking the question, what sort of background you may have and so forth. There will be a mic passed around the room as well. Uh, so, do we have a question to begin? A brave soul. Do we have any questions online? Not yet? Well, I guess my, uh, Val, please, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> Did we plan for the risk of no questions? Yes. <laughs> Stay there was all. something we forgot. Yeah. Uh, good no. afternoon, everyone. Val Flynn is my name. I'm um, the security coordinator with ECHO in Brussels. Uh, that terrible, dreaded word. I'm a donor. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to pick up, um, actually, I was on the advisor group, and it was great fun, actually. It was very testing. Uh, we had some great fun, actually, doing it. We uh, filled out quite a number of beer mats, the backs of beer mats, when we were doing it. It's the nearest <laughs> a man can get to childbearing. <coughs> uh, the process was very, very painful <laughs> and lengthy, and I didn't realise it was only just 18 months. I thought it was a lot longer. <laughs> anyway, I will get to my question in a minute, um, if I have one. Uh, but um, from it, I'm, I'd like to pick up on the last recommendation. It was just one word, and that was, I think, two words, uh, donor support. Mm -hmm. And I think we can't. And that's why I actually came over here today, because... Um, Echo, and along with the other donors, we've done quite a bit in the past. Maybe it hasn't been as joined up as it should be. Uh, maybe we should be doing more, and we will do <coughs> more. Uh, we would like to walk the talk, as they say, on these issues. I only spoke to our commissioner, uh, Commissioner Georgieva, yesterday. Told her I was coming over. Thought it was a great idea, and we we're having a very uh, lengthy discussion about her forthcoming mission to Haiti and the security implications and everything. So it is a very hot. Uh, topic. It is one dear to her. Um, it's one that she holds dear and she thinks it's very important and she said that she will be looking for ways of supporting this in the future. Mm -hmm. I would just like mm -hmm. to relay that message to Thank her. You. I would like as well, just looking around the room, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. uh, to say things like we do recognise the excellent work that you have been doing and the funding that you've been doing on these issues. There's a lot more donors out there and a lot of us are doing it. We need to join it up a little bit more and we need to move on as well from this. There are other issues we have to tackle like training and everything and supporting organisations like uh, Olivia, I'm watching Oliver down there, mm -hmm. EISF, Red R as well and the organisations that who are doing excellent work. So as donors we must get our act together and, and do that. But it has been um, a great experience and I'm confident, I'm confident that the, the original version has saved lives mm -hmm. and it has prevented injury and it has protected equipment, vital equipment and information as well. The new one will do exactly the same thing and the challenges uh, we'll face. And as well, you did, if I may pick up on the, mark you, the remark you said uh, about uh, it's not cheap. Uh, security is not cheap, but try bad security is mm -hmm. very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to also say as well to our colleagues who are online from the UN as well, we do very much appreciate, and it's sometimes it's, it's not said enough, the work that the UNDSS, the Security Management System of the United Nations has been done. They're easy to criticize, but Gregory Starr and his predecessor, Sir David Vaness, and goes, have done excellent work as well, and their outreach and their initiatives like Saving Lives Together all these initiatives are very, very good and very welcome. And the last point as well I'd like to say is we need to have more security collaboration mechanisms out there, deep field as well, which we'll support. So there is money there from donors. Uh, it's a question of tapping into it and it's a question of us doing it. But this is an excellent initiative and that's why I came from Brussels today to pass the message from our commissioner that we are fully supporting these type of initiatives and it's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, Aaron, sorry, could I just, I, I, it was an oversight on my part, but what I didn't say was that we did have uh, significant donor funding in order to, and support, in order to produce this. And <clears throat> it was, uh, we, we had funding from Swedish CETA, the UK government, and USAID, OFDA. So this was much appreciated. And these people, donors were also very active members of the advisory group. So it was very good to have that input there. Thanks. I think it's very important <coughs> for us overall that as we talk about collaboration and working between different agencies, that we also remember that donors are often in the situation where they have programs in country that they themselves are executing, and they are facing similar challenges to us at various stages. And sometimes we don't engage on that level to try to find common understanding as much as we could. So thank you very much, Val. Do we have another question or statement from the floor in that perspective? Yes, thank you. <coughs> Thanks. I'm Sara Pantoliano. I'm the head of the humanitarian policy group here at ODI. Um, I'd like to, uh, I don't remember which one of the speakers talked about leadership, and you've all emphasized how important it is that um, you know, security is not just the domain of the security manager, but it's really part of the culture of the organization. And that ultimately is reliant on having a good leader that understands the importance of security and makes sure that it is taken seriously within the organization and you know this is supposed to be a good practice review not best practice as we said but good practice is there anything that you can share you know from the work that has been done reflecting of where there have been examples of good leadership where there were incentives that have you know um, put forward you know better practice than in other <coughs> contexts whether there have been um, particular I don't know backgrounds or um, um, you know sort of something they've built upon, they've offered uh, models that we can follow. Okay, Mark, would you like to have a stab? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think from our own experience, uh, it really <coughs> is, I, I don't think you need to, to be a security expert to be a, a leader. In fact, I think just the opposite. Well, not, not to downgrade the leadership <laughs> capacity of security experts, but, but that the idea is that it has to be integrated into the rest mm. of the programming, and it, it, it is leadership's responsibility to create that space for discussion, to, to, to take something like this to the field and to ask questions. You know, wh what are your, what is your... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have two mics for a oh. That's okay. Just, uh, you know, and, and to really take, take discussions to the field, to, to make sure that this, uh, as Aaron just said, doesn't sit on one specialist desk, but is, is throughout your operational team, but also to just go to the field and ask a question like, what, you know, to what extent have you negotiated your access here? Who, who have you had direct communication with and what did they say? And to what extent does, you know, just ask the national staff, what, you know, what's our organization doing here? Where did we get our money? I mean, things like that. I, I, I think that's, that's leadership. It, it's simply creating focus and, and making sure that everyone in the organization understands the importance of it because it's one of those invisible things that can get swept aside uh, uh, too easily until, um, as Val Flynn just said, until it, it becomes very evident. The, the, the hundred out of, the, the 99th out of the hundred cases and, and that's, that's the one that all of a sudden the whole organization is consumed by. So it, it's it's leadership's responsibility to make sure that you're not in the expensive uh, uh, domain of cleaning up after a security incident or having them, uh, or just unable to, uh, to, to, to provide aid the way you're supposed to. I think Hans Jörg. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Hans Jörg, would you like to comment on that question? Yeah, thanks. Just to, um, perhaps on, uh, on the last point, on the leadership point, um, I very much agree with uh, uh, Mark, I, I think there is, uh, in allowing a lot of this good practice actually to, uh, to take place, I mean, behind all of this is actually, in, in many instances, good leadership on part of humanitarian coordinators, uh, heads of agencies or, or, or country teams. Um, but I think we cannot speak about good leadership without looking at the factors that still impact uh, or, or prevent uh, good leadership uh, from, from from being, from being one, as, as Mark argued before, that is aware of risks and manages risks and isn't itself then risk averse. And I think what we've seen, and I'm speaking now very much for the, for the UN system, I know that the practice uh, of, of agencies is, is very different, but 
we've had in each of those security major security incidents um, like uh, Baghdad uh, or Algiers um, uh, more recently um, there were big reports uh, written and immediate, immediately the search was for someone needs to be blamed for this um, uh, happening. There's always someone who does something not or something too little or, you know, in hindsight is 2020 vision um, for all of those who write the report. So w I, I think one important aspect, and we've discussed this with um, Greg Starr and others who sees it very similarly, is if you create an environment where a humanitarian coordinator or um, a resident coordinator, deputy SRSG, whoever it may be the leader, despite all reasonable and good efforts that he or she undertook, meaning there, are, um, there is risk analysis, you have your security management team, you go through these things, you follow through uh, on, on, on some of those, those issues. Despite your best efforts, there's an incident and then the question, the career of that senior most leader is on the line, um, then you will not have leaders that are actually willing uh, to um, to manage uh, that risk, meaning to accept within the limits uh, that we all spelled out that people may actually get uh, uh, injured uh, or even uh, even uh, killed, that people uh, that that assets may get uh, stolen, that kidnappings uh, may still happen, and I think that's that's we need to look at what still prevents and impacts negatively um, on the uh, on the exercise of, of leadership, and I think there's a lot of fear from what I uh, could detect over the last year that we've uh, been doing the study, a lot of fear, un outspoken or not so uh, outspoken, on part of um, leaders of country teams that if they dare a bit too much, if they take a risk, um, uh, that they may get punished uh, for it if something goes wrong. And I think uh, organizations, I think like the ICSC, have a slightly different culture and that is something that we really internally have to learn. And that's something where uh, Greg Starr, uh, the, the head of DSS, actually has come out and said, if uh, someone has done all reasonable steps, and that can be to say, well, uh, urging uh, agencies to um, make their <coughs> compounds MOS compliant um, and, and, and track that uh, MOS compliance uh, is being worked upon and so on. If all these reasonable steps have been taken that would, would have been taken by anyone else, um, then uh, one must refrain from, uh, from, from putting that person's uh, career on the, on the line. And that, I think, will over time contribute to this culture of, of moving from risk aversion to, to managing a risk in a responsible manner. And that means that if you manage risk, it may still go wrong, it, and and that's very sad, and it's a it's a it's a terrible thing for those. Um, so I don't want to be or appear to be uh, nonchalant uh, uh, about this. You know, it's a terrible thing, but it is part of our reality. It's part of our job, and it needs to be worked into this. So if people, and that goes to the second point that I just wanted to really emphasize uh, that that Mark made before, it goes to the professionalization of our business. Um, if you work in the deep field in an area where you where you have um, a, a terrorist uh, operations, high uh, military operations, then operating in this in the deep field in these areas is a skill. It's not something that that you just do because of your your instincts of of wanting to to deliver um, aid. You need to know number one how you in a certain situation protect yourself. There are measures that you can take and that you can be trained on how to um, even respond in a, in a, uh, towards a kidnapping, for example, you know, if it happens uh, to you. Um, how to, to t look at your own security. You need to look at uh, not only your own security, uh, but exactly be able to contribute to the judgment call that, that Mark mentioned, um, the, the, the life-saving program criticality. You know, how critical is it actually um, for for the beneficiaries that we go this deep into into the risk and lastly um, you need to have some of those negotiating skills not everyone has those negotiating skills not everyone has the the, the, the skill and the knowledge and the, the personal um, demeanor to actually sit 
with some of those, uh, you know, more or less um, uh, crafty, sometimes nasty, sometimes just very skillful um, uh, people on the other side of the aisle with whom you have to uh, negotiate skills. So I really would argue um, that on our own, uh, on the home front in a way, in our broader HR portfolio, a lot of things need to happen. If you send people um, into high-risk environments, they need to know that the leaders will manage risk and that there's a chance that something may happen to them um, or, or, or uh, their organization, number one. So when you go, I'm not saying sign a waiver, but you need to know, you need to be aware that this, um, that, that there may be an impact uh, to you. And secondly, that those people who go, not just be sent because of their good instincts or their good um, intentions, but because they have the skills to operate in these areas. And I think we're all, all of us, all organizations are very far away um, from, from that, some closer to it than, than others, but as a community as a whole, I think that professionalism is still lacking. And my last point is just very quickly to uh, the colleague from, from uh, ECHO and to thank, of course, ECHO for, for your um, steadfast support around these security issues and, and the funding. But I think what we're talking about, um, some of us, is, is two things. It's number one, obviously, the investment in study work of this kind and in the security arrangements and, and so on, which costs money and, uh, and, and probably more money than it has cost uh, five years ago and 10 years ago. ago and it will be costing even more money in the future. But that's only one angle. I think the second angle is, is what we're trying to highlight, also a cultural shift um, uh, uh, among donors, really, uh, to say, look, we would like to see the following happening happen in a country, but we do understand and we give organizations who will have to go into the deep field and risk their staff's life and, 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 and their integrity and their, um, their assets, we need to give them um, the, the time and the, um, the space to, uh, to, build that, uh, to build that environment uh, with, with those people in the deep field, uh, sometimes over months without, as, as Mark uh, very eloquently said, the delayed demand for impact. And that is a discussion um, that uh, I haven't seen really take place uh, to the extent that I think it is necessary uh, among donors, and I, I saw um, uh, my Canadian colleague there, uh, Leslie, and, and I think that that is something that would be very useful, I think, for, for us to decide, uh, to, to discuss, I mean, operation agencies with donors together, because I think we have a common interest there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess my only final response to that is leadership is not necessarily something that's top down. And I think we sometimes fail to see that because we see security as a means of practices and procedures and we tend to inherit aspects of blame culture, as uh, we've mentioned before, or more importantly, the idea of punishing if security is not done correctly, and that in itself needs to be addressed. You can have very good advocates from all levels of the organisation who are leaders in practice, and that should be encouraged. I know that Jane has a question, and so I'd like to pass it across to you. <coughs> and then we'll address a few of the online <coughs> questions for those waiting for answers. Thank you. Jane Cocking from Oxfam. Um, it's not so much a question, well, I suppose it is a general question to the, the, the room as a whole in its, in its widest sense. And it's to pick up on this point of organisational responsibility. Um, it, it really is incumbent upon us, I think, as humanitarian organisations to be very clear with people who, with whom we sign a contract as to organizationally what is the risk appetite that we have as an organization um, and what is the threshold of risk that we we expect to take and I think very often the the hard reality of that of spelling it out is something that we shy away from and you know after 60 years of working in insecure environments in Oxfam we have finally come clean and stated on the front of our uh, on the front of our security policy that we recognize that risk can only be managed it cannot be eliminated and that staff will be exposed to risk of serious injury and death and coming clean on that took a great deal of discussion and actually getting there. And we say in the same breath that we will do everything we can to minimize that risk, but we can't eliminate it. 
And I think being very upfront about that is, is, is really important because unless you do that, then you can't have the conversation that Mark was referring to about values, understanding, and how you actually pitch that on a day-to-day -day basis. Because sitting in Oxford, I have no idea what hundreds, thousands of individuals are doing out there tonight. All I can say is that we have the framework, we have the guidelines, and we do everything we can to, to, to express those values. And what was interesting uh, was when we were putting together this statement, we did a sort of bit of a random sample of asking people what did they think our risk appetite was as an organisation. And almost without exception, they said uh, it's less than organisation X, and it's more than organisation Y. And I have no <laughs> intention of telling you <coughs> what X and Y were. <laughs> but they were pretty much the same. Which kind of said to us, actually, most people in Oxfam sort of feel the same way. But how do we express this and how do we set that framework is, is really difficult. And so it's been really difficult for us. And I'm sure... Uh, you know, we're not there yet. I'm sure we'll end up revising it. So, I guess you know, my my question is, who else is res is wrestling with that at the moment, mm -hmm. and uh, can we perhaps, you know, do a bit more of it together, please? <laughs> That'd be interesting to see a show of hands. See if anyone else here is wrestling with that at the moment. Yep, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've got a few grudging hands being raised. It is an issue. It is an, a, an ongoing issue, and I think in terms of the way in which we address any risk in the organisation the threshold and the liability issue is the fact that we have to say to staff, there is no way we can eradicate risk. I mean, we've got risk in terms of walking to work on a snow day in that respect. It's whether or not there is an active information, mm -hmm. awareness and education campaign in an organisation so staff do understand what that level actually entails and whether they feel they've got the skill set to deal with that. I would like to actually pass this to an online question just at the moment before coming back to a couple of questions here on the floor. And one of the questions came through from a former aid worker who's worked in Indonesia. She's now based in France. And she's asked us if, the, well, she stated that the ICRC has practiced the active acceptance for more than a century. Why NGOs and researchers are only discussing this now? And I think that's a, an interesting sort of view about whether or not terminology in that respect has been used by people and then changed. And I'm just wondering perhaps uh, I've either if Mark or Hans Jörg, who are talking more about the way in which we approach acceptance, have a view about that. If you feel that we are only discussing it now, <coughs> or do you think it's something that's always been discussed, perhaps never really pro uh, promulgated and, and taken forward? I mean, I, 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 won't, I won't speak to that for very long, because I do think it, it really varies from organization to organization, and then within organizations, within teams. Um, I do think it's it's good to, to, to sort of bring it to the fore with a term that brings in a lot of, uh, you know, uh, whether it's outreach or negotiated access or some, you know, uh, adherence to certain principles and explaining yourself to the community. I mean, those are all <laughs> things we've been doing. But bringing them together sort of within a framework of, of a term I, I think is helpful so that, so that people can keep going on it. But I'd be very curious, there's some people in the room here who you know are, are security consultants, and, and you yourself work often with that. And I'm, uh, when you bring this to other organizations, I mean, I can only speak on behalf of MSF, but when you bring this to organizations, uh, you know, wh what do you find? Do you find that people go, oh, uh, or, or not? So I think you're in a better yeah. position to answer it <laughs> than I am. Well, I think with moving the microphone, I, for us, it's a situation when we do go into organizations, we realize that. It's not an unknown aspect. It's something that we do as part of our needs assessment. It's something that our staff do on a regular basis, but they generally don't give the terminology to. And they look at you and they say, but we do this already. This is normal practice for us. We talk to the people that we're working with. We engage on a regular basis. This morning, I had a very interesting email from my country director in Pakistan, sorry, <coughs> who spoke to me about an <coughs> issue that he'd noted in one of the small communities and about who the contact person was in that community. And he said, this should be knowledge throughout all of our staff and I'm gonna make sure it's knowledge. He wasn't speaking about security. He was just speaking about good programming. And I think that's where when we start to talk about active acceptance in relation to security, we do run into issues. One moment, sorry. Sorry, it's catching. 
<laughs> You'll be next. <laughs> We do run into issues then, and I think that's very important for us to <coughs> realise that if we mention the word security and acceptance and we start talking to people, their eyes may glaze over. If we start talking about the fact that it's general programming and what they should be doing on a regular basis, they'll start to understand the application of it, perhaps in a format that is easier to apply to their day-to-day -day work, and then we can bring in the security discussion and talk about then how it impacts other aspects of risk and so forth in the work that we do. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. The first one is... Could, could I just... Absolutely. Please go ahead with a quick comment. Yeah, just, um, I mean, just straight to the question, actually. I think um, why are we discussing this today? Because we've seen over the last uh, decade what uh, everyone... Mark was talking about the politicization of, of aid, but I would say particularly the last five or seven years have see, uh, seen a securitization of, uh, of aid as well. The community looks much, much more at security. And speaking for the United Nations, um, the security uh, discussion ever since Baghdad 2003 has actually become the prism uh, through which to view some uh, our operational reality as, as humanitarians. And I think what we're trying to do is, um, through the acceptance lens, reintroduce uh, active uh, acceptance as a, as, as a prism into this discussion to say, it's not only security that, that is the prism uh, for, for um, our operations, meaning you want to get somewhere and the question is how much hardware and how much intelligence um, uh, do you have on, on, on board uh, to get there uh, securely, but also to go back to something that uh, the, the, the person rightly so said, many organizations beyond the, the ICRC even, um, that's what they used to do, uh, building acceptance, going to a community. Humanitarian work has always been da dangerous, but they, they, um, they uh, uh, looked at, uh, at building that trust and the confidence in working with communities first. And then I think over the last decade, particularly since those, um, um, uh, since those uh, uh, conflicts um, that we referred to before, that cost a lot of uh, humanitarian workers' uh, lives, the Afghanistan and Iraqs and Somalias and so on, um, security has just, for many of our organizations, been the, the, the first and foremost prism. And so we mm. forgot a little bit to, to emphasize um, acceptance. I'm not saying individual organizations uh, uh, didn't do it. I mean, the ICRC just continued. But for many others, security became the prism. So what we're trying to do is pull it back a little bit towards uh, uh, what, we, what we used to do in the past. And that, for us, at least, is, is uh, 2003, Baghdad, um, the death of Sergio Villardimello and um, over 20 other colleagues uh, was one of those um, um, points of, of, of a clear turn where people um, spoke much, much more about security uh, outside of the humanitarian community, but also within the uh, humanitarian community. And just perhaps a footnote um, to this acceptance discussion, and I uh, didn't hear everything that obviously was, has been said um, before. But we haven't really spoken about um, a national staff. And something that has also happened within those seven or eight years, at least for us, of, of uh, strong discussions about security is that we've all taken to, uh, to, uh, to out, uh, outsource or, or delegate security risk onto national staff and, uh, and, 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 and contractors uh, and so on. So uh, we conducted actually part of our study is a national survey um, that we that we did, and this national survey has actually received now responses from over 1,000 national staff members. And the interesting thing is that those national staff members, over 1,000 national staff members, they all said yes. We feel we're the num we're the most targeted and and most uh, vulnerable. But they they said so um, because of the functions they carry out which is interesting. They, they said so because they are drivers, they are security guards, they are, it, it's, a, it's the jobs that they perform that are very often, without us necessarily thinking about it, in the first line of, uh, of attack. When an attack happens, when a car gets kidnapped, it's a, it's a local driver, you know, that gets kidnapped or, 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 or attacked. Um, and I think there is a, is a, within this whole debate, there's a huge um, additional um, area that we need to look at, which is how have we dealt actually organizationally with our national staffs and have we just deferred the risk on internationals to, to nationals uh, or are we looking at, a, at a oper uh, an operation more holistically? And I think this, this national survey that we did is really so impressive 
um, uh, and has will contribute actually to some of the demystification also around these these issues. Um, that we're thinking of uh, making that available actually possibly as a standalone uh, product. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I was mentioning, we have actually run slightly over, so we're only going to have time for three more questions before tea and coffee is being served in the room just outside. So I'd first like to ask, and that will be one question online, but firstly, Mia, I believe you have a question for us. <coughs> Thank you. Not so much a question as a comment. Mia Beers, USAID OFTA. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank HPN for the important piece of work. I think I'd like to reiterate what my ECHO colleague said in terms of our deep appreciation for the work that um, a, a number of humanitarian actors um, have, uh, UNDSS, UN agency, operational agencies, um, NGOs, Interaction, others have done to further the security management agenda. Um, but I did also want to mention, because I do agree with Hans Jorg, I think there's much we can do within the donor community um, to further the discussion as well. Um, <clears throat> this year with GHD, there's a, a specific work stream um, that's been undertaken um, that was just launched a few weeks ago in Geneva among the donors on um, uh, security humanitarian access issues um, that's going to be looking at um, kind of donor practices and ways that we, we can look at supporting, um, not talking about just financial, but more advocacy and kind of the range of issues in education education on these security issues. So I just thought it was important to flag that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mia. And I'd just like to note that one of our online participants has also reiterated that um, comment in terms of saying, how can NGOs and development companies convince donors to separate the project implementation budget from the project security budget, as uh, he feels that often organisations must utilise program funds for security needs, which becomes a detriment to beneficiaries and so forth. And particularly for smaller organisations that are primarily financed on donor funding and don't have pools of private donations, I think that's more of an issue. Oliver, would you like to ask your question or <coughs> make your comment? <coughs> Thank you. My name is Oliver. I'm working with the European Interagency Security Forum. Um, and I think one thing is great to see, you know, from an, from an security risk perspective is the discussion with senior managers and CEOs that actually this discussion is happening. I think that's already two years ago that would have been impossible. I think two years ago if you would have had a launch of a bigger security manual, there would have been five people here, there would have been some technical um, expertise in the room, but not actually really thinking about it in a more holistic way, what it means in terms of accessing people. Um, I mean, there were a lot of thoughts went through my, through my head um, on the day on, on these presentations and so on. So I will keep it to one question, and that's both to Hans-Jörg and Mark. And um, you were both saying um, it's important for humanitarian organizations to distinguish yourself from the bigger agenda, the politicization, politicization <laughs> of aid, <laughs> Damn, the English, um, and and to make humanitarian assistance again what it may be wars or you know going back to basics is a notion you you are hearing very often. At the same time, <coughs> you're using um, the term aid worker when it comes to the casualties and the number of attacks, and I'm wondering how do you see these these uh, these statistics because. Um, Obviously, they're happening in Afghanistan, Pakistan, etc., where exactly these uh, uh, notions of stabilizations are there. So are the people who are attacked there, the aid workers, are these stabilization workers or are these humanitarian workers? So if they're not humanitarian workers, have actually the attacks on humanitarian workers really increased? Just think back on the mid of 90s, West Africa, Chechnya, etc. That's where we're humanitarian workers were attacked in Liberia and um, also in Chechnya, the ICRC, six killings. And, and I wonder how, whether you differentiate that, because I have the feeling we sometimes mix these a little bit up in the, in the discussions. Mm. I'm not sure whether I was clear with that, but mm. Mark nodded, so yes. thank you. <laughs> Would you like to? No, I, I, I ask Hans York to, <laughs> <laughs> to respond. Yeah. Uh, no, I can, Excuse me. I can come in if you want. Absolutely. No, I, I look. I what I what I what I meant to say, um, and thanks for the for the question. Um, uh, first of all, I think it's very difficult in these environments. One has to be very careful uh, to to say because so and so many uh, uh, so and so many humanitarian workers got killed because we have a, an integrated mission there or we have uh, the following environment. But I think what, what the figures show, both yours, ours, and everyone's, 
is that if you look at the context where over the last number of years we've had the most incidents against humanitarian workers, they coincide with those situations where, and I, I, I have to say personally dread a bit the word um, politicization, but these are very political contexts. Now, I'm not here to pass judgment on whether uh, stabilization is the good is a right or a wrong thing you know stabilization probably in its right in its in its own right is a very important thing to stabilize the government to to end the conflict and, and so on and so forth <coughs> but what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to say is in an environment um, that is very political that has um, a lot of uh, political action politically motivated action um, of, of a military, of a political government, state building nature, and so on and so forth. It is important um, for humanitarian workers um, to, to communicate at various levels, and not only in press releases, but much more importantly, uh, on the ground with their counterparts, uh, why they are there, what they are doing, and, and how they're going to go about the, um, the matter. And in some of the conversations we've had with humanitarian coordinators, they actually say that um, by and large, local communities, um, we owe them much more credit than we give them probably. Local communities are able to distinguish uh, who is, is coming in for what purposes. So they can discern who delivers aid and, 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 and who doesn't. And that's why in my introductory remarks, I said it's so important that we're seen not only as as uh, talking the talk, but also walking the walk when we go to the to the to the beneficiary communities. Not only saying, "Look, I'm different. I'm a humanitarian worker, and I really want to sit here to plan with you for the next 24 months um, what we can do for you," but to actually deliver something. When you're seen as delivering and adding value, you also contribute um, to a positive um, a perception. Now, all of that. Um, cannot prevent that there are agendas out there that go for the for the um, quickest high yield target, and the quickest high yield target um, when you cannot target a political uh, operation or a very um, uh, uh, protected military operation may actually be a United Nations or other high profile um, agency. So. There are parts that you cannot prevent necessary because they, they are an extension um, of the political nature almost or the, 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 the political context that you are and those actors um, trying to uh, make political statements. But there are many, many other things that you can actually do, including in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And it's very, and it's very um, uh, I, I think it's under-researched still, how many even US, say, NGOs, I mean, the, 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 uh, a few years back, the, the, the word was, you cannot have, you have to be very, very careful if you're a US NGO in Iraq, in Jiala province, and on top of it, uh, in an Islamic country to deliver as a, as a woman. I can tell you, we've met quite a number of, of, of aid workers, American women working in Jiala uh, province, being there, and were not attacked, and not because they were driving around with armed escorts every single day, but because they also did their homework um, of, of building trust and confidence. So can that prevent that in the, those circumstances, someone says, you know what, that office of that US NGO for us, because we cannot target anything else for political reasons, becomes a high yield target and we target them? No, we cannot. But that is exactly the, the, the risk that we were defining. So in, in conclusion, I would argue that the more political the context is, the more of an effort we need to make um, in explaining what it is, and I don't want to use the word distinction, you know, but in explaining what our purpose is, what humanitarian purpose is, in, uh, in, in delivering uh, aid and actually deliver this aid. We make, the more political uh, the context is, we make, need to make an effort to really look at what Mark alluded to before, to see um, what our practices are. Are we actually viewed as subcontractors, um, and, and I think that goes to Oliver's point of the stabilization workers, subcontractors of um, 
uh, of, of a military force. Um, that doesn't mean that that military force may not be there for legitimate or illegitimate reasons, for whatever reasons. You know, that's not my our business to, to judge. But if you know that that's a very political a political factor that may impact on your perception, you've got to explain if you want that, not everyone wants that, if you want that, you need to explain that the, 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 the services that you deliver um, are different. And, and for that, you need to be with those communities and you need to be close to the communities. And so um, that's how I would, I, I would, I want to take the discussion really away from these very simplistic um, argumentations that I think have dominated our discourse for, for too long now. Uh, uh, humanitarian aid workers get killed because of uh, uh, military operations and integrated uh, missions. I'm not sure that is always true. We're also not taking the precautions uh, that we need to t uh, take or have the professionalism, as we said before. But there is also uh, an aspect in there of needing to do much, much more in terms of um, this distinguishing us ourselves in terms of uh, who we uh, collaborate very closely with, who we receive money from, uh, and plus, very importantly, explaining daily, day to day, not only in one statement, but daily to those we're actually working for and delivering for um, while we're there. And our experience now and the feedback that we got from uh, many of the humanitarian coordinators actually is it does work. Local communities understand uh, when agencies actually deliver goods that uh, benefit them, uh, that they are different from, say, uh, a state building or institution <laughs> building exercise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you yeah, no, it's a difficult question. I mean, you're actually, you know, kind of, what is the identity of an aid worker and do we humanitarians own it? And I, I, I think I'd probably say that these, what you said, are they stabilization workers? I mean, a, a British expat, uh, I think her name was Linda Norwood, was recently killed. She worked for Development Alternatives, Inc. I mean, the Inc., it's quite clear what they were doing there. They were as Hans Jörg just said, delivering on the, the political and military objectives of a belligerent party. But that doesn't mean she wasn't <coughs> delivering aid. And I think a lot of stabilization work is aid. It's still aid. The difference is, I, I, I just to be very quick, all aid in a, in a highly politi politi man, I, I, I can't even blame. <laughs> None of us can I, say I, I, it. Yeah. yeah, no, and it's, it's, not, it's not my, it is my language. I'd hate to hear the word in German, though, Ollie. Um, <laughs> But in, the in, a in a very, very polarized context, <laughs> the, um, you know, in, in those kinds of polarized contexts, all action, whether it's just a simple saving of life or, so or, 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 you know, or, or, or anything, all action is political. The difference is what is the intention of that action. And that's a difference that's very, that, that requires a lot of education of the people on the ground with guns. But if the intention is to stabilize or to build peace, then for me it's not humanitarian action. If the intention is to save the life of a child, and that's it, then it's humanitarian action. And a lot of it's aid, and humanitarian aid is one part of a much larger set of activities that, that fall under this rubric of aid. So are they aid workers? I'd say yes. Do we need to actually look at the statistics better and start seeing, well, you know, who are these political aid workers or humanitarian aid workers? Um, I think that would be interesting. Thank you very much. We have time for two more questions as long as we keep the answers very brief. So firstly, one from the floor and then we'll have one online. Um, hi, I'm, um, I'm an intern at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, my name is Mishri Shonik. Um, I'm going to ask this question really quickly. Basically, um, Hans mentioned about the need for creating acceptance. And then you mentioned, Mark mentioned about how um, humanitarian groups and NGOs have come onto the wrong side of the people and they're seen as interfering and taking sides in um, similar situations. Well, for example, Hans mentioned Sri Lanka. Uh, in a similar context, the U United Mission in uh, Nepal with its Maoist problems and trying to rehabilitate <coughs> the, the young child soldiers and um, put them back into life and education and other similar organizations, because there they're mixing in with politics and rehabilitation re, uh, with humanitarian aid. But similar organizations in Nepal are be being seen as interfering, and just recently in September, I think the UN MIN was recently given an extension, which it wasn't earlier, and they, there was a big political debate about whether it gives an in extension or not. So my question is, how do you regain acceptance with the very people who may not let you back into the country? 
because in Nepal it's the governing bodies that aren't going to let it back into the country if they don't extend its contract. Thank you. I mean, I guess <coughs> my <coughs> first response, to keep it very quick, is transparency. Being very open about your mandate and your mission, and I think we can use that perspective from our programming in Sri Lanka, because we offer a, we offered safety and security training, which was, from our perspective, obviously going to be an issue with certain elements of the government. And one of the most important aspects of that was demonstrating to them why we were doing that program, what the outcome would be, and how it was important not just for the humanitarian community, but overall for the community of Sri Lanka. And I think in terms of any programming you conduct overseas, where you run into problems with acceptance from different actors, you have to engage that transparency immediately to <coughs> demonstrate what your mission and mandate is, quite clearly. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's very, very difficult. It depends on the organization. And I think organizations that are that are set up to deal with sort of the, the sharp end of just assistance, you know, humanitarian aid, give blankets, give food, give medical care, I think that becomes a lot easier than an organization that is set up to deliver on larger goals, uh, you know, for instance, the goals of development, which involve political transformation and other things. And I think organizations can have the full support of the community and not have the support of that very, very small minority of the community that has guns. And that's, that's where it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, uh, it, it's not just the community that will protect you, it's, it's also uh, the minority. So for me, it comes back to, to, <laughs> to whether it's possible in, in highly polarized contexts to, uh, to be a multi-hatted, you know, multi-mandated agency, to be doing state building at the same time of doing, you know, just delivering something like uh, aid to people, uh, rather than just building the system when the system itself is is uh, in the crosshairs of one side. Thank you. We appear to have lost Hans Jörg for the moment, you unfortunately. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So we are trying to call him back at this stage, but I would like to then just move on to our final question from one of our online participants, and that's primarily because of time, and I know there's probably a number of other questions and we'll see if we can answer any of those over coffee. Um, and if not over coffee, then I'm sure they'll be picked up at other events over the next couple of weeks. But the final question. <laughs> oh, we've got no, we don't. <laughs> we have a blank room. <laughs> the final question was asked by uh, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Michael, I believe it is, O'Donnell, who are both psychologists at the Member Care Associates in Geneva. And I think it's a fitting comment for us to try to end on, or question for us to try to end on today. And that is, what are three things a smaller NGO can do to integrate GPR8 into their organisation in both HQ and the field? So a bit of a challenge for us, I think, up front, as we've lost our <coughs> participant. Do you have? Well, I, and I'm, I have to apologise, but I think my voice is finally gone. So I'm, it's a very convenient way of getting out of answering the question. But I. <laughs> I, I actually don't think that I sure. can. I'm okay, sorry. That's fine. Not a problem. Mark. <laughs> yeah, no, just off the top of my head, mm. one, one would be to, to bring it in and have the, have that discussion. Uh, you know, whether it's the day of workshop or whatever. Uh, you know, even without. I mean, great if you can bring in an outside facilitator. But even without that, just to have a day of discussion around security. What kind of risk does the organization run, and how does it deal with it? The second would be. You know, even small organizations have. You know, the, you know the, the, this log frame type of planning, something like that, and you know, very uh, sort of simple to put in there a strategic objective of we want to improve the security, the risk management of the organization. We want to improve the acceptance of the organization in terms of its work. Very hard to deliver on those, but I think just just putting it in there as one of in in an annual plan. I, I, I've got that on the brain because I've been it's that time of year. But in an annual plan to put that down. Um, and then lastly, I, I guess it would be, it, especially for small organizations, to look for partnerships. I mean, you know, there is expertise out there. Uh, there are people that know how to do these things. Um, you know, I, 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 and to ask. Uh, you know, I think the, the security people I know at some of the big organizations are happy sometimes mm. to answer mm. questions, uh, and in particular when something goes wrong in the field, and to be a resource. Uh, I, I don't think anybody kind of w w would say no to a phone call saying, you know, can we discuss mm. this with you? And uh, sorry, Aaron, I mean, I, I will say that I think that the GPR can help in, in these sorts of situations because this does give guidance in terms of what the things are that one needs to, needs to look at and consider. And so by using this as a starting point and then working collaboratively with others, asking those questions, I think that's the, the way to approach it. 
questions. Absolutely. The, mm. the recommendations mm. provide a very good starting point for discussions if you haven't raised this before with your staff or with your teams. And I think it's very important for us to realise that no practice or procedure comes into an organisation overnight. It's not a case of being able to wake up in the morning and say, from now on, we are going to have daily reporting on this, we're going to have a system of incident management, and we're going to manage security very well without realising that you're changing culture at the same time. So implementing GPR-8 is about using a number of different methods. Think about how you work with your human resources team, how you work with performance management, work planning and so forth as well, because there are a number of different ways you can get people to discuss the values and recommendations that don't just have to be in terms of a one-on-one -on -one about security in that respect. Is there a final burning comment from the floor or question that we need to consider? No? Well, thank you, everybody, especially for your time in terms of staying over for questions. There is tea and coffee available next door. And I'd certainly like to thank Wendy, Mark and Han, um, Hans in terms of their presentation and their discussion this afternoon. It's been very informative. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.